So Franco wrote in and wanted to know more about the so-called metabolic flexibility. And I, I kind of feel like I should probably do whatever somebody named Franco says to do. So I'm going to go ahead and knock that out real quick. And the idea is that a human should be able to process both fats and glucose as fuel. We should be able to move back and forth as needed. But people kind of a little bit broken today and things can kind of go wrong that can make this a little bit harder than most people would think to do. So we kind of want to break this down a little bit and just don't view this like, yeah, I want to be metabolically flexible by Friday. I'm going to a hoedown. They're going to be serving these deep fried snicker bars wrapped in bacon. I want to be able to metabolically flex all over those bad boys. That's not what we're talking about at all. This is not about having the ability to eat a bunch of junk and a bunch of fat all at the same time and, and win the game. This is all about the body having the ability to process both fats and glucose for fuel. So in this video, I'm gonna give you seven steps that you can take to increase your ability to have some metabolic flexibility. Let's jump in. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So with metabolic flexibility, a person would be able to have the ability to burn glucose effectively for fuel when they were eating carbohydrates. And when they were not eating carbohydrates, the body would be able to process the fats in the food that we ate but also process stored fats as fuel. And in this scenario, the body kind of always has a fuel source. The body really likes that. Things go well when the body can always access fuel and keep you going for the whole day. So the things that we need to understand, number one, is that in order to process both glucose and fats, we need to be able to digest all types of foods. And it's really common today for someone to be dealing with digestive malfunctions that either restrict their ability to like digest protein correctly and break it down or emulsify dietary fats so that the body can use those dietary fats. So when we eat food, our stomach should make hydrochloric acid so that we can acidify that food and start the breakdown process. And then once it's acidified, it should leave the stomach and go into the duodenum, which is the first 10 inches of the small intestine, and that's when the gallbladder should squirt this alkaline bile down onto that acidic product and help us neutralize those acids. But also that bile is used to help us emulsify or break down our dietary fats so the body can use those dietary fats. So the problem is it's really common for someone not to be making enough stomach acid and it's really common for someone's bile to become too thick and sticky to flow correctly. So if either of those sides of digestion are not working correctly, now the person can't break down a variety of foods, but they're still expecting their body to be able to operate on a variety of foods. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You need to be able to break those foods down correctly if you expect your body to function the way that it's supposed to function. So if you're having any type of digestive symptoms like burping or bloating or diarrhea or constipation or acid reflux or nausea, or even skin or acne issues, or maybe your food just kind of sits there like a rock in your stomach for hours. All of those issues are signs that digestion is not working the way that it's supposed to work, and the odds of you becoming metabolically flexible are pretty low if you can't even metabolically digest. We need to digest the food to be able to utilize it. So if you're having those symptoms, those need to be corrected. And my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, chapters three and four, walk you through how to figure out which aspects of digestion are not working correctly and steps you can take to improve those. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put the link in the description below this video so you can get the whole thing totally for free and that'll walk you through figuring out that process. And step number two is to fix any blood sugar dysregulation problems. So if your blood sugar is going way high or if it's really going low and crashing and you're having hypoglycemic type issues, both of these have the ability to create trouble and remove your body's ability to access different types of fuel source for different reasons. So all you have to do is you can just look at your fasting blood sugar with a glucometer that you can pick up at a pharmacy for 30 or $40. And if your fasting glucose is over 100, that can be an indication that you may be leaning too far on that insulin resistance side. Now this is not anything that's diagnostic, it's not a confirmation, this is just a sign that things could be going the wrong way. Because if a person is leaning too insulin resistant, that means the cells are not listening to that insulin when it tells them to, hey, sweep this glucose into the cells. Let's use this for fuel. And if the body's not listening to that insulin, then the body's like, oh, I'll just make more insulin. So now more insulin is being made to do the same job 
that a small amount used to make. And this high insulin is going to tell the body to store fat and not to burn stored fat for fuel. So when insulin is high, it removes the ability for the body to access that stored fat and burn it for fuel. So now if you're not bringing in carbohydrates, you don't have a fuel source if insulin is still high from all the carbohydrates that you ate because your body had to produce this extra insulin just to process those carbohydrates. Now, if your blood sugar is below like 70 when you test that fasting number, then that can be an indication that you're processing glucose too efficiently, too aggressively almost, and you're creating sugar crashes. And the problem is for a lot of people, when specific issues are going on, if there's a blood sugar crash, it can really raise stress hormones. And these stress hormones, when they go high, can create a lot of trouble. And part of the trouble that it can create is, hey, it's telling the body, we need to make our own glucose to deal with this emergency that we have going on. The body views these low resources as an emergency. And even if you're not eating carbohydrates, your body will make its own glucose just to deal with the low resources. And that can raise insulin as well. So there's a lot of issues where blood sugar can be out of the right range that can really create a lot of trouble. So keep in mind that blood sugar being in a good range of you know 75 to 85, somewhere in there, that doesn't always mean that everything is going great, but at least that's a better sign. But when things are off on either direction, you really want to correct those issues if you really want to be metabolically flexible. So we'll put the links in the description below this video for our videos on how to improve insulin resistance and how to improve hypoglycemia. So according to what your fasting glucose was, you might get an idea of which one might help you more. Step number three is to stop snacking. If you're constantly giving your body food and especially carbohydrates, why would it ever turn to a situation where it's going to start burning stored fat for fuel? You're constantly saying, oh, here's something. Hey, here's something. Why don't you have this? Here's a little something. Hey, I got something for you. If it's constantly coming in, the body doesn't need to access stored fat for fuel. It has this easy fuel that it can just use right there. So we want to get ourselves into a position where we don't need to snack. Now understand that I understand that not everybody qualifies to not snack. They might fall apart and become an emotional wreck and yell at the mailman because they don't like the shorts that he's wearing if they're not having food on a regular basis. But when you need to snack and you need food every couple hours or so, then things are going wrong. Things are not being digested correctly or you're not pulling enough minerals out of the food or your blood sugar is crashing. You really want to look at your physiology and get an idea of what's going wrong and why do I need to snack all the time. When you can set your body up where you don't need to snack, now you have a longer window of time between your meals where the body can say, hey, I can, I can just access this stored fat and use that for fuel. And it's more willing to do that when everything is going well. Step number four is to eat in more of a low carb manner and put those carbs in specific windows of time. Now, if you're eating a ketogenic diet or maybe a carnivore diet that's a really super low or zero carb diet, then you're already on the right track to really setting yourself up to creating this metabolic flexibility by teaching your body how to access stored fat and burn that for fuel. But if you're not eating that way, just lowering carbs and putting it into windows can be enough to help you create some flexibility. So we like to see people eat carbs in a way that might supply the body with some carbs that they need if they're in a situation where they really need a little more carbs, but use carbohydrates that aren't going to create this big spike and crash in blood sugar. The higher the carbohydrate count, the more that insulin is gonna go up and then the insulin stays high a lot longer than the blood sugar would. So blood sugar comes down, no fuel is left, but insulin is too high still to allow the body to access stored fat for fuel. So we want to eat carbohydrates that will only lift insulin a little bit. We like to eat what we call like medium carb foods, like butternut squash or sweet potatoes or yams in smaller amounts, and eat some carbohydrates that'll give the body some fuel, but won't create this huge spike in insulin. The next step is to just put those types of carbs in specific meals of the day. So you might have carbohydrates by having, you know, maybe some broccoli or spinach and green vegetables that have some carbs in them, but we really only want to put those higher carb foods in one or two meals per day, and you want to put them away from the nighttime. That means that while we sleep, we have this window of time where insulin can really come down. So we want to extend that window by either not eating carbs the next breakfast or not eating carbs at night before we go to bed or both extend that window in both directions. So we want to make it to where we're not always constantly 
hey, here's a little bit of carbs and lifting that insulin. We wanna give the insulin a chance to really come down. That can improve a lot of insulin resistant issues for a lot of people, but it also teaches the body, hey, insulin's low enough, I can access this stored fat and burn it for fuel and allow the body to adjust to burning fat as much as it likes to burn glucose. Step number five is to use intermittent fasting if you qualify. So if you can extend that lower carb window in the morning by not having carbs in the morning, you might also be able to extend that window of eating by not having breakfast in the morning and just wait until lunch to eat. And that really allows insulin to come really low. Now keep in mind that intermittent fasting is not right for everybody. And some people have malfunctions or imbalances that can really be magnified by intermittent fasting and create a lot of trouble. So we'll put a link in the description below for our video on who should not use intermittent fasting so you can get some insights into whether that might be right for you and might be beneficial in this scenario. Step number six is to do some easy cardio. When you do easy, non-high impact cardio, you can burn fat for fuel during that exercise. When the exercise is too intense, the body's not gonna be able to burn fat as efficiently for most people. If somebody's really fat adapted and everything's going well, they can burn fat during some of those more intense things. But for most people, we wanna make that exercise easy where you can still carry on a conversation, you're not huffing and puffing, and everything's just going along. When you can give the body another opportunity like this to say, hey, well, I can burn fat for fuel to do this, it makes it more adapt to burning fat for fuel. Now, if you can put this easy exercise in the morning before you've eaten, then you're really magnifying the benefits because the body is already in this fasted state where it's ready to burn fat for fuel. And you go on an easy walk, maybe it's 30, 40 minutes or something, and you can burn fat during that process a lot easier. Step number seven is to increase your dietary fat intake. If a person isn't bringing in enough dietary fat, then the body's a lot less likely to be willing to burn stored fat for fuel. There's a lot of processes that the body needs fat for to be able to function correctly. So if a person isn't bringing in enough fat, that stored fat's gonna be like money in the bank and the body's gonna hold on to that instead of burning it for fuel. So if you're still living in the 80s and you're eating low fat and wearing parachute pants, you really wanna get that corrected and put more good dietary fats into your diet. Keep in mind you need to be able to emulsify those dietary fats and digest them correctly so you really want bile flowing when you're going to increase your dietary fats but the first step is you got to bring it into the body right so all of these steps can help push a person more towards that metabolic flexibility just understand that for some people this could take quite a while you're not going to fix insulin resistance by thursday it can take some people months or even years to really correct that if the problem is significant and those things can take time. So don't rush yourself on this, but the more of these steps that you can put in your favor and help your body digest and process those foods better, the more you open up the door to giving your body the opportunity to process both types of fuel. Now, since digesting those fats is such an important deal, check right now and jump over to our video on 10 signs of poor bile flow to get insights into whether that might be a problem that you need to correct to create your own metabolic flexibility. Let me know how it goes.